we will be recording, but we will not be live streaming. We had a little accident this morning. Not the church, but I guess the pole that brings electricity to the church kind of had a brownout of some kind. But we reset things, and it fried some equipment upstairs. So, but it is, it is functioning as best we can. But we got it working. Mostly. 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 <laughs> you know, I don't mind old school church. You know, if I have to yell from the front, it, we, we will just have church. And, I, and I, that was my thought this morning. You know, no matter what technology, worship in the dark if you have to. It's good to just come and, and to worship with our church family. Just want to let you know, this afternoon, if you are free, around 3 o'clock, there will be a hike and a bike, I believe. Hiking and biking at the Buxton Trail. If you've never been to the Buxton Trail, it's a, it's a paved road, okay? It's a nice, mostly flat. It's a Victor-approved road, okay? All right? So if it's Victor-approved, you know it's okay, okay? So um, today at 3 o'clock, um, they will have a picnic today or afterwards. So please turn out if you're not doing anything. I know it's, it might rain, but we're praying and how Ann works. God, gets, God, God, God makes these things happen. I've seen it all the time. And so, I, and so you're welcome to come and to join us for that. Also, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, um, it's Mother's Day, by the way. Uh, and, and, and I know um, some people are home and, uh, and might not have something to do tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. You, if you're a mother or, 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 or a woman, you're welcome to join uh, the ladies at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll have some breakfast food. We'll have some uh, fellowship time. Um, so we want to come tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We would appreciate you coming tomorrow. So that's at 10 o'clock. This morning is, 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 is wild this morning. I've, I've never seen so many kids. I mean, I, I, I almost see more kids than adults. It's kind of a lot of kids. I'm scratching my head. They all came out, but it's so wonderful. Um, and, and and this is my position as uh, as I'm speaking for the church. Thank you for coming. And if your children makes a little noise, it's okay. We have a mother's room in the back if you need to feed. And if kids need to run around, you're welcome to the fellowship room. Just we want to make sure this church is 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 welcome and open for you. Okay, and and so uh, it's always wonderful to see young people, and we are glad you're here. All right, well, I'll give this time to, uh, to Teresa. Before I get started, um, I want to just clarify. It's the Buxton Trailhead of the Banks Vernonia Linear Trail. 3 p.m. is when we're meeting there, and after we walk and bike and have fun, we're going to have a picnic, supper, and then a worship together. So I hope you can come. All right, so... Probably two years ago, no, even a year ago, I was terrified to get Bible studies. I didn't feel like I knew enough. And I've been a Seventh-day Adventist my entire life. But it was very frightening to me. And I did probably 10 years ago work with a Bible worker and gave some Bible studies um, I think two or three times, um, once with somebody and then twice by myself, and then it just kind of went away because I didn't know what I was doing, and I felt really, really bad. It's like the people lost interest, and I was, I was freaked out. But now things have changed. That was be before when I tried to do it. It was just trying to come up with a study on my own and try to come up with the topic on my own and look up all the text on my own. But we don't have to do that anymore. I have multiple different types of Bible studies. This one has 25 lessons. And this one has 27 lessons. And then I've got a couple more that um, also are about the same. I'll cover the same topics, just in di different orders, and they're all very, very well written, and they make it super easy. So when anybody is interested in giving Bible studies to someone else, 
you will be given two of whichever Bible study you want to do. One for yourself and one for the other person. So when you give the other person a lesson, you go home and do your lesson. And then when you meet together the next week, you just talk about the lessons. You've got it there for you. Everything is done. And so I wanted to reach out to people again and say if anybody is interested in helping me give Bible studies, I would be greatly appreciative. I have currently three active, no, four active Bible studies going on for myself. Um, we have some other people, Gary and Consuelo are doing a Bible study, um, and we have uh, some other Bible studies that are going on, and you know, God is blessing. People are hungry, people are searching, and they're coming to us and they're saying, would you please give me Bible studies? I want to know. God is calling his people. And that's what we have right now. And so I want anybody to, that feels called by God to help out to please come find me. Um, I have a business card on the library counter. If anybody wants to grab that business card and give me a call or text me or email me, whatever you would like to do, I would love some help because God is calling his people and there are a lot of people out there who are hungry. All right, thank you. Have a great Sabbath. Good morning, church family. We will start our service today with our songs. I'm trying to look at, it's not going to work. Oh, there you go. Our first song today will be soon and very soon. So we'd like you guys to join us. song is one of my favorites since I was a child. Um, Seek ye first, and Jesus is the answer. Yeah. 
last song in our opening song. We'd like you guys to stand up and sing with us the sanctuary. Sabbath is that the whole morning is always calm and peaceful and relaxing. <laughs> is, is sarcasm a sin? <laughs> All right, very good. It was, it, it was a lot of fun getting things put back together. But at this point, it's time for, uh, for offering where we get to, uh, the Lord permits us to help him spread his uh, offer of salvation throughout the world. So today's loose offering goes for a uh, church budget, I believe. So anything that uh, you, uh, you add into the basket will go directly to supporting the, um, the local events here. So would you join me in prayer for the blessing? Heavenly Father, we ask that you, you bless these funds as they go out into the world, help them to uh, further your will and your plan of salvation so that as many people as are willing to accept and are moved by the Holy Spirit will um, accept you as their Savior and, uh, and join us all in, in heaven uh, when you come to take us home. Bless those hands uh, and minds that, that give their, their, their money and their service and their thought um, to, this, uh, to this endeavor and uh, encourage us, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to support you in a faithful way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Deacons. Aha. Pathfinders, I should say. There we go.
about to announce the Lamb's offering. <laughs> each and you could actually put this on your head if you want to okay you will be part of our story today so there's one two okay oh I have more do we have any more kids yes I do there's a I have plenty I have plenty there you go Noah all right all right so I'm gonna read you guys the story actually I'm gonna sit here, okay? We're gonna watch them over there, okay? While I read this story. Okay, so our story today happens in the city of Shushan. King Ahasuerus was the king, and in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and servants. For six months, the king showed the riches of his glorious kingdom. At the end of six months, he held a seven-day feast in his palace. I'm going to ask you kids to sit over here, pretend you're in the banquet, so you're part of my story, okay? Let's go sit over here, and you keep looking at them, okay? You can look at behind you if you want to, okay? I'll continue reading. So on the last day of the king has, king's banquet, he ordered his officers to bring Queen Vashti before his guest. The king wanted her to wear her royal crown and yet to dress in such a way that everyone could see what a beautiful, attractive woman she was. But she had actually disobeyed the king. B queen Vashti refused to go and be put on display. And the king got angry and said to Queen Vashti that he, she was no longer the queen. He wouldn't have her in the palace. She could go and she had gone. Meanwhile, the king needs a queen. And the king made a proclamation of a beauty contest in search for a new queen. In Shushan, there was a young, beautiful girl named Esther who lives with her cousin Mordecai. She is so pretty that she was chosen to, as one of the finalists that would join other young girls to be picked as a queen. For 12 months, they were getting ready, and Esther will live in the palace for preparation before they meet the, queen, the king. After 12 months, she came into the house royal and the king was overcome by her beauty, breathtaking beauty. And the king loved Esther above all the women and she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all other girls. So, so, that, she, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen. So children, God used Esther, an ordinary orphan girl, to become a queen and a hero for his people. And God has a plan for each of us as we trust and follow Jesus each and every day. And Jesus' plan, uh, plan for us is to become his children, his prince and princess. Um, uh, girl, boys and girls, we have something for you guys to pick up over here. Um, um, you can give those flowers to your for Mother's Day, and I will hold on. Pastor will have something. Well, a tradition here, we like to to appreciate all the mother or wannabe mothers or ladies that come to our church. So what we do is that the kids have prepared uh, some flowers for you. And the church has provided a little gift for you. 
So uh, if the children can help me, can you guys help me? Go help. Can you guys take these to all the ladies? If, you, if they're a lady, pass it this top to them, okay? Can you help me? Here, I'll give you some. Here, <laughs> pass it down to the ladies. There, here you go. There you go. Pass these out to some ladies. Here, here. here you go, Noah. No one here? I have more if we forget anybody. And, the, and there's some ladies up I see some ladies up at the balcony too. I see some mamas up there too. <coughs> you got two of them, Noah? Yes. Okay. Great, great. Did we get for everybody? Oh, here I go. All right, okay. On behalf of the church, happy Mother's Day. And for those who are not even mothers, thank you for uh, your motherly love to our friends and family and church members. God bless. At this time, we have something special for us. Um, I want to introduce you to someone. Okay. Oh, thank you. Extra. I want to introduce you this morning to a gift that God has given to our church family and a gift that has given to Cami. Um, this is Michael. Michael Thompson. It's a good name, isn't it? Um, it got a little tie on, too. Cute. Um, how, how heavy was he? He's 8 pounds, 12 ounces. 8 pounds, 12 ounces. Big boy. We're thankful for every baby that comes. And we're appreciative of every baby that's dedicated to God. And this morning, I want you to read a Bible text. And it's taken from Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And it reads as such. And they brought young children to him, and that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And he said unto them, Suffer the little children to, to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Children are welcome here. Children are welcome with the kingdom of God. All cuddly, bubbly, all of them. And we are so fortunate to have this young child here. And Cammy said, I want to dedicate this baby to God. And that's what we're doing today. We're dedicating Michael to God this morning. And with that, we asked the church to, to help raise little Michael. Uh, it takes a village. It takes a church to raise our children to serve God. And I, I just feel the honor and blessing to have this baby here and and to support him and to support Cammie and the rest of the family, Olivia, and hey, she's got hands full. Um, but we are appreciative for the love that God has given to us. So, may I? Wow, I haven't held him yet. Whoa, this guy is beauty. Okay, puny guy. Let us pray together, and we'll anoint this child. Heavenly Father, in my hands lays your child. What a blessing it is to have another child in our arms. And we feel humbled by this fact. Please bless Michael. His road ahead of him, the life he shall live. I just pray, Lord, that his life might be dedicated to you. That he will serve you with all his heart. That he will be a tool for your mission and your purpose. Be with Cammie also. And be with Olivia. And be with Halen and be with Caleb. Be with the family as they all come together and to love and to support each other. Bless little Michael now. Please take care of him, watch over him, keep him safe. May he be healthy. And may he all grow up, Lord, grow up to be in the Lord. We thank you and the privilege of honor of holding him, of watching him, of watching him grow. I just pray Jesus will be here always. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Amen. That was great. I love that. All right. Time for us to worship the Lord in prayer. So I invite you to join me as we pray uh, to our Father. And uh, Neil, if you're able. Heavenly Father, we pray in your holy name, in the holy name of your Son, Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we go through the world today, there are many different opinions that oppose each other, and it's difficult for us to understand what's right, what's wrong, sometimes which way to go. So my prayer today is that you would grant us the gift of discernment, that we would understand what is true and what is false, what is from you and what is not. Help us to know the way to go each and every day in each and every situation. And if we, if we misunderstand or, or choose incorrectly, we ask that you forgive our sins and cover us with your righteousness and your salvation through your grace. There are those of us that have great praises to, to lay upon you, and, and you know what those are, and so we offer our praises to you. And there are those that need your help throughout the days, throughout the weeks. Some are, are physically ill, some are dealing with stress and strain and, and uh, anxiousness and depression, and uh, some of us have a, a crisis of faith. So. For all these things, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us in, in all the different types of health that uh, we each need, and then keep us safe in our travels and journeys throughout the country and, and just throughout the week. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. I'm in the third sermon of my series on love, and next Sabbath I'll be taking a break. I'll be here, but Chris will be preaching next Sabbath, but after that I will finish uh, my sermon set on love in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, when I was in college, and I, I mentioned this, that when I was in my early 20s, I had to really reevaluate what my beliefs were. Um, growing up as an Adventist is a good thing, but there could be many misunderstandings of what Adventism is and was. And I, I grew up in a home that had many misunderstandings about religion, about God. And I had to sort that out. And I told you in my previous sermon that I, I needed a base to start with. And the base that I chose was love. Love had to be the foundation that I built all my theology on. Every thought. It had to be. If it wasn't loving, then it can't be part of that frame. When I was, not I was, but about five years ago, I went through something similar to that. I've been a pastor for many years, but God challenged me to relook at what I believed in. Relook at even the theologies I took for granted. And to be honest with you, it was challenging. God really challenged many of the concepts and notions, and he, he, He's still challenging me. I, I hope you're okay with this, but I am in a past, I'm a pastor in progress. I am. I, I, I study God's word and oftentimes I'm like, what? And, and to be honest with you, I, 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 in one sense, I'm less sure. Are you kidding? You're all right? I am less sure of what I believe in. But in the same sense, I trust God to continue to lead me. And that's where I'm at. You know, last year was, uh, man, last year was an interesting year because we bought the new home. And um, for anyone who's a general contractor or done working on your home, oh, oh man, it's, 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 it's not, it's fun, I guess, but it's, it's, it's hard work. 
Uh, and all I did was just the backstop of a kitchen. I mean, everything else the contractors did. Okay, and choose what lights to go in, what not, right? But before we bought this home, I always heard these words: make sure it has good bones. Okay, right? Make sure it had good bones, and and I I began to understand what good bones meant because we we tore that whole church, I mean, whole whole house apart. I mean, it, we took all the my wife took a hammer, you know, all the drywall, took everything off, and when we got into the actual this part of the house, the frame, man, they used some real strong wood back then in the 70s. You know, they, they would double, I mean, some thick wood. I mean, I mean, well, it is a knock. A knock on people who make houses now, the house I used to live in, you kind of shake a wall a little bit, and the whole wall is going to be, you know? And they have, you know, just two by fours, you know? And it's like, yeah, that's your house. And in the 70s, they built it a whole lot different. They actually built houses that you want to keep around for a while. Not the easiest or the cheapest house. And, and I realized, when you have good framing, when you have strong wood, when you have a good foundation, you could put stuff together. And it, it will hold fast. But what I really in this era of, of what I call the microwave popcorn era, everyone wants things now. Everyone wants things cheap. Everything wants just, 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 just slap some drywall on there. Okay? Use the cheapest wood and the cheapest nails and, and you hope 10 years later that the house stays upright. Okay? And in a sense, I feel in our theology, in our churches, we've taken shortcuts. We've, we've kind of said, well, yeah, Jesus loves me, and we never think about what really is, what really what God is talking about. And some of the misunderstandings that we've had. One of the misunderstandings that I want to talk about is heaven. There's a misunderstanding about heaven, because heaven is something that is central to all our theology. We want to go there. Yeah? But there's a misunderstanding of the heaven. And one misunderstanding I didn't even put up there is that some people believe we're already there. You know, my, my mom passed away, and many of her friends are, are not Adventists, and they kept on saying to me, yeah, your mom is looking down at you, and no, no, she's not. She's just sleeping. She's just resting. And there's misunderstandings. One misunderstanding is, is about gates. There, there's this preoccupation about gates. Like, heaven is a hard place to get to. They, they make heaven really hard. Okay? And it, and, it, and, it, and it works to the favor of those who are in control. Because if you control the gates to heaven, you could tell people whatever you want them to do. And you could tell them to pay whatever they want to pay. Therefore, we've had all through history, people controlling the gates into heaven. You know what I'm saying. They'll tell you, you have to be a certain way to get to heaven. Or you have to pay a certain amount to get to heaven. Or you shouldn't do things. And believe it or not, this subconscious thought of gates have pervaded all Christendom, even us today. We're not immune to this concept that heaven is a place of restriction. God is trying to keep out everybody. He's trying to keep out sin. Sin cannot enter heaven. No sin can. But that doesn't mean he's trying to keep people out of heaven. And when people read the Bible, and when the Bible says that Jesus loves everyone and wants everyone to be saved, believe it or not, that is shocking to people. I want you to understand that. The notion that God actually wants to save people makes people like, think. And my, my thought is, where did you get the idea that God didn't want you to be saved? And that seems to be the crux of a problem. We seem to worship a God that doesn't want you to be saved. Really. 
That's what the world takes God. And that is a false view. God does want you to be saved. Second misunderstanding, good people. We believe, Christians believe, that good people go to heaven. Bad people go to hell. This is a false notion. Because in Romans, Paul has told us, all have sinned. Yes? All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. And and let's be frank. If only good people went to heaven, it would be Jesus and Him only. We have a notion that we have to be good. And this is a notion that has pervaded our world. Because our world, including Christianity, by the way, has become a works-based religion. Do you know that Christianity is different from every religion in the world? Every religion in the world. People say, well, isn't Christianity just another religion? Like every other religion? Buddhism, Hinduism, Mormonism, you name it. Isn't it it the same? No, it isn't. Christianity is the only religion based on Jesus. Not on what you do or how you do it. It is not based on performance. You don't earn heaven. But understand, it's a mentality that has pervaded our society that good people go to heaven. The third notion, a reward. There are some weird religions that if you blow yourself up and kill a bunch of people, you'll get 40 virgins in heaven. I'm thinking, what kind of absurdity is this? Well, first of all, blowing people up. But second of all, that heaven is just a 40 virgins? That's your reward? We, we, we've made heaven into earth. You know, we, we think that, that heaven is something that we, an extension of what we want here. To be honest with you, there is nothing here besides the love of our loved ones that we'll bring into heaven above. Amen. This world is not what God wants. And we believe that heaven is some kind of reward, but it is not a reward. Heaven is something that will come to us, not because we've earned it, but because we have been transformed. A fourth misunderstanding, pleasure. I believe pleasure is the most overrated thing on earth. It's it's fun. It it, it makes me feel good. Let me tell you something. Heaven isn't about fun. It's not because you feel good. Heaven is more real than just something in the outside. It, It goes to the core of our existence. My friends, heaven is deeper than just fun. Fun is an overused word. Fun is something we do here because we're bored. My friends, what God has given to us is more than just fun. He wants to give us, here's a word, joy. Joy is what we want. Fun is a mask that masks our pain and our lack of joy. But what God is offering us is something more deeper than that. So here's the realities. Jesus is the gate. Let's go there. Let's go to John 10.7. Someone told me, you know what, Pastor? We're not opening the Bible enough. And I agree with him. There's something, there's something wonderful of all just going, well, I guess... Hand phones and stuff, cell phones, but whatever. I'm, there's something good about Bibles, you know, the actual thing, you know? Uh, I'm not criticizing you, Kurt. It's okay. You can use your cheater, cheater Bible there. Okay. In John 10, 7, it, it says this. It says, Then Jesus said unto again, Very, very, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus is the gate. He is the way. And here's the beautiful thing. Jesus' gate is open to us. How do we enter therein? 
Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gate. I have the keys. My friends, how blessed is that? You want access to the most beautiful place on the universe, and Jesus is that access. And he freely gives to every single human being that wants that access. There is no restriction. Isn't that the cool part? Here's the cool part. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It has been given to you if you want to accept it. He is the gate. Let's go to the next one, next reality. Who goes to heaven? Let's go to Matthew 21 to 31. Matthew 21, 31. Hey, look at that. Chris got the real Bible going this time. I can use it. All right, I like it. I like it, I like it. You know, we're getting so rusty. There used to be a time when we said Matthew, our hands kind of knew where Matthew was. Kind of, you know? It's including me, by the way. Now Matthew is M-A-T on the computer. Okay? There's something cool to kind of like know where the, where the scripture is. Okay? So Matthew 21, 31, read these words. Whether of them twain did will you did this father? They say unto him, the first. This is about a story about the two boys. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Who is in the kingdom of God? Publicans and harlots. Did you did you read what Jesus said? Publicans. These are the worst characters. Okay? They're in the kingdom of God. Who's in the kingdom of God? Harlots. You're going, well, you're saying, well, pastor, come on. Jesus is just kind of commenting. No, it's true. Rahab, she was a harlot. Mary, she was a harlot. And they're in the kingdom of God. Zacchaeus, Matthew, tax collectors, the worst of the worst, the thief on the cross, the worst of the worst are in heaven. My friends, you would be surprised who's in the kingdom of God. And before you tell yourself, Pastor, I'm not good enough to be in the kingdom of God, I'm telling you, oh, well, get in line. Get in line. There are plenty ahead of you who are far worse than you. My friends, the kingdom of God is not for the good people, it's for the saved people. It's for those who accepted the gift of Jesus Christ to be our gatekeeper. And he lets all those who come in. What a wonderful message of hope. Immortality is a result. John 3, 16, you know this one. John 3, 16. Well, you should know by heart, but I'll read it. Okay? It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. My friends, what God wants to do is transitionalize from us from death into life. Does that make sense? We were born into death. Our DNA carries death. You are dying, yes? Can anyone change that fact? I am 50 plus years old now. Kurt, it's your fault. I'm just following you. Okay? And every year I'm thinking, something is not right about my body. Okay? Things hurt a little more. Things, you know, you, I got a scratch, it just stays there longer. My hands are wrinklier. Okay? It, it, we are born to die. Sin has come into this world. And because of sin, I am not talking about just physical sin. We always think it's a physical concept. It's not just a physical concept. There's an emotional concept. There is a spiritual concept that we are sinners. We are isolated. We're going to talk about more in this sermon coming up. Isolation is what the world creates. Unity is what God creates. Isolation is death. Cooperation is life. We enter the kingdom of God not individually. Did you hear me? Heaven is not a solo trip. For people who say to you, well, I don't need church. My friends, you're basically saying, I don't need life. 
Did you hear what I said? Heaven is not a solo trip. You don't go to heaven by yourself. You go to heaven because you love, and we'll get that. Final reality here, eternal joy. Psalms 1611. Psalm 1611, you read these words. Thou will show me the path of life. This is the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures for when? Evermore. I'll tell you something about this world. Nothing lasts. True or false? Tell me one pleasure in this world that lasts. There is none. For every drug addict, for every person drinking the wine, for every person who, who has an adrenaline rush, for every person who's looking for something, we all know the result is, is the same, isn't it? There is no pleasure in this world. It all ends. You know, people say, Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, they say. That's what they say in the commercials. Well, I've been to Disneyland. You know what I say? It's the saddest place on earth. You know why? Because people are empty. They're looking for something. And well, the saddest part is they're looking for something in Space Mountain. They're looking for something in Cinderella, which are fantasies, but not realities. My friend, the true pleasure that God is wanting to give is the joy of the Lord. My friends, when we subscribe to Christianity, when we decide to walk on the Christian road, some have said, well, Pastor, why would you go down that road? It's such a, quote-unquote, hard life. It's such a difficult life. You have to give up things, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. And I'm saying, myself, don't you understand? It is when I give up the world that I can finally live the life that God wants for me. Pleasure? I'll tell you what pleasure is. It's in God. Amen. Joy? I'll tell you what joy is. Joy is obedience. Obedience to God. No amount of fun. No amount of excitement. Because all our, all our families, our kids are all wanting fun. What's fun? What? No, I don't want fun. I don't want fun. I want joy. I want true pleasure that comes from loving the Lord. What is our goal? I think we need to understand what our, what our goal is here today. But I think as Christians, we forget what our goal is because sometimes we think our goal is heaven. Is heaven our goal? We just suck it up here on earth and one day we'll go to heaven. I think some people have made that, made that uh, kind of uh, agreement that this world is not going to be that good, but heaven is going to be a great place. Or could it possibly be something else? Yeah, there it is. Or should our goal be Jesus? I think if we figure out what our goal is, we'll figure out how we can live our lives. I think for many Christians or non-Christians, the goal is, what are we going to do after this world? No, I, I think we're missing the point. The goal is, what can we have in this world? I think some people said, well, you Christians are always thinking about the future, can't take care of today. No, I, I totally disagree. It is the Christians that are living today. It is the Christian that is living to the moment. Because they're not living for the future, they're living for today. What is a Christian? You know, when I, when I got married, I, I thought I was a Christian. I got married, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a pastor, you know, I, I went to theology school, you know, I'm a, I know Greek, okay? I thought I was a Christian. And so when I married Esther, I think, I'm going to teach Esther what a Christian means. You know, I'm going to have Bible studies with her, I'm going to share with her what Christianity really is, okay? Oh my goodness, what a dumb thing to say. 
what a dumb, th okay, us men, every man here, we don't know what a Christian is. We know the idea, we know the definitions, but being married to a woman, I realize she knows God in ways that I just bang my head. I realize that I could kind of see God in a framework, in some words, but when it comes down to it, she kinda, she's kind of honest with me. He goes, Danny, you say you love God. How are you treating people? And I'm like, uh, people? What do I need them for? You know, I'm a Christian. I don't need people. And she's like, oh man, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And she was right. Because a Christian wasn't about doing the right things. You know, I thought a Christian just did all the right things, you know? And, and, and I, I did the right things. I, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this. But that didn't make me a Christian. I thought a Christian was maybe something I could, here, here, here we go, believed. I believed all the right things. I believed in the sanctuary. I believed in Sabbath. I believed in this, believed in that. Therefore, I'm a Christian. Well, let's hold it back here. Oh, how about this? I hope for the right things. I hope I could do this. I hope I could do this. And I hope I could do that. No, time out. What is a Christian? It is Christ in you. Being a Christian is not what we're doing or what we're saying. We could all say the right things. Do the, we could try. But what a Christian is, is a transformation that happens right here. I was talking to a, a guy, and I was giving Bible studies with him. S one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Brilliant. I mean, his brain is wired like, like Google. Okay? I mean, he's, like, he's like plugged into a computer. Brilliant. He's a smart guy. Okay? And when we're in Bible study, he goes, I know these Bible verses, and da 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 He's telling me all these things, you know, like that. And it was, but I don't feel close to God. And I said, yeah, I know, because you're not a human being. I was being blunt. I said, you're not human. <laughs> Can we love? Well, I don't need people. I just need God. Okay, time out. Time out. If we don't love people, what's the point? We haven't come across what God really wants. And I was talking with him, and I, and I told him this. I, I said, I'm here to give you Bible studies, but in reality, God has shared with me, I'm here because you need to get married. I told him that. I said, you need to get married. He's like, who's going to marry me? I know, that's a problem. Okay? Um, that is a problem. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't like people. Yeah, that's a real problem. Um, but you're empty, aren't you? Yeah, I'm empty. You're lonely, aren't you? Yeah, I'm lonely. Because God has put more into you than just information. You're a person. God wants something more than you, from you. And you know what? Two years later, he got married. <laughs> Miracle of God. I kid you not. Poor, not poor lady. Wonderful lady. Okay? Challenging. Okay? To marry a robot. Okay? But he got married. And you know what? He's changing. In a way. In a way. In a little way. He's still a smart guy. But he's realizing, oh, she's hurting. Yes, you just hurt her. Let's not do that anymore. Okay. Okay? Yes, it, it matters how you say things. Okay? It matters that you're not rude or blunt. I just want to be honest. Oh. Okay, just stop. Okay? Honesty, yes. But loving is more important. And he's learning those things because of marriage and the woman. And I said, yes. And you know what? He's learning more about God. 
John 4, 12 says this. No one has ever seen God. That is true. Yes? But if we love one another, God remains in us. Check this out. This is true. This is true. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, where is God? In us. When we love, God remains in us. And his, here's the cool part. And His love is perfected in us. Your love to God, your understanding of God is directly correlated to your love to each other. To, for someone to say, I don't need people, I don't need church, is saying, I don't need God. The opposite is true. If loving people is teaching us more about God, then what does Lucifer want today? He wants us to hate each other. Do you get my point? But you see, by loving, we become more like God, to learn more like Him, but when we hate and fight each other, we become more like the enemy. We become more isolated. So we read in Timothy, look at what Timothy says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Terrible times. People will be lovers of who? Themselves. We've become an isolated society. Do you see that? Do you see it? My friends, drinking is up. Drug addiction is up. Pornography is up. The people are not together. They're isolated more than ever. People thought social networks, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram will bring people together. It hasn't. It's made people more people isolated. When I was in Korea this past month, and I was looking at these Koreans, all of them, on their subways, and I told you, they sit there with their phones. All of them. All of them are sitting there with their phones, right? And I'm saying to myself, this is terrible. Because you see, Korea was founded on the basis of community. Do you, you get my point? The strength of Korea was community. That we bonded together. And that was a strength. One of the greatest weakness of America is isolation. We become too isolated. We go to our homes and our work and our cars. We never see each other. We drive by each other. We yell at each other at Costco. Yeah? We have to deal with people, right? But besides that, we stay home for all our material. And I, and I actually told one of the Korean people, I said, if this keeps up in Korea, it will be a, it will, it will be a disaster to this country because they're becoming isolated. Everyone's just YouTube. Everyone is just Instagram. And they're becoming self-focused. Lovers of money, oh my, oh. Koreans work so hard. They work so hard. I, it, I look at them and say, how do you work so hard? Four or five a.m., they're just, they're, they're just killing themselves. And, and I said, why do this if they want money? I want to be rich. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. It's hard, boastful, proud, abusive. Here you go. Disobedient to their parents. It was shocking when I came to America. It, it was shocking when, when I was a child, when I was seven years old. I've never seen someone yell at a grandparent, ever. But I saw one here, and I said, this is shocking. We're losing respect for our, our senior citizens, our elders. You know, we've lost that respect of sir. I, I do like going to the South. I love when they say sir and ma'am. I, I, I like that. I think it's nice to have respect for our elders. But that's gone away. Ungrateful. Oh, talking about a millennial society. Unholy. Wow. Our society, we, we are in all kinds of nastiness. Without love, here we go. Are we forgiving? Is this society forgiving? Uh -uh. You say one wrong thing, they will bury you. You say one wrong thing on Instagram, they will just thrash you. We're not a freaking society. Here we go. Slanderous. Without self-control, 
rule, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited. This is, a, this is not a good list. Lovers of what? Pleasures. Then lovers of God. Having the form of godliness. I'm good, but denying its power. Change. What God wants for us in our community is that we might be one. That as we love each other, here's the thing, we become more God-like. You cannot become God-like alone. Only through community, only through, a, I believe, a church community can we become what God wants us to be. Let us not fool ourselves believing that we would go to the mountaintop Take your favorite laptop with you and to know God. God comes from the relationships that we have on this world. Love is the fundamental building block of all human relationships. It will greatly impact our values and morals. Love is the important ingredient in one's search for meaning, Gary Chapman. Love is the very ingredient that makes life work. My friends, what, what God wants to do for us is that we are all doomed to die because we're all sinners. And sinners become isolated. Do, do you hear me? It's not just selfishness. Selfishness is isolation. It, 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 it's, it's wrapping yourself in yourself. And, and it's, not, it's not God. Here's a, people make the mistake. God doesn't punish sinners and or bless those. No, it doesn't work that way. What God is saying, if you stay in sin, you will die. Does that make sense? That's what God is saying. If you remain selfish, if you remain isolated, you will die. It's a natural course. But he's also saying, if you would love each other, you will live. Love is a very fabric of our existence. Love is the building blocks that we as human beings become alive. When I do marriage counseling, I always, well, even, even before I do a wedding, I always do premarital counseling. Always. Because <laughs> I, got, I got into marriage, I'm like, whoa, there's a steep learning curve. And, and, I mean, it's, not just woman, by the way. Woman in itself is, yeah, I'm still figuring that one out, okay? Um, that's hard. But just, just, just the standard rules, like standard rules, like when you talk to your spouse, here's one rule, turn to them. That's a good one. Men? Uh-huh. Um, where my smartphone other is? Um, this is not a good thing. Okay, hon. Gotcha, honey. What'd you say, hon? No, 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 no. Okay? Uh, um, uh, it usually works better if this thing goes down and you actually face the person talking to you. And you know what? That lesson took a little long to learn. Okay? Uh, made a little cu couple of, hello, wife here. Oh, yeah. Uh, there are a couple of rules. When, you, when, when the lady is talking a lot, they don't want you to fix them. I was thinking, okay, keep on talking, hon. I got this. I can fix this. Got it. Got it. And she'd be done talking. Going, you know, hon, you should do this. I'm like, this is not working well, Kurt. She's not getting any better. She's like, I don't need you to fix me. I just want you to hear me. I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, I get, yeah. Hmm. I, I, she once told me that before I got married, you know? Like, I read the book, but it's like, I must, must miss that chapter, okay? Um, you know, and, and they're, they're, but that's just two. I mean, there's so many rules that if you want a safe marriage, I, that's why we do premarital counseling, okay? Just, just basic rules just will help your marriage a lot, yes? So what I'm saying is that there are also basic rules for community. That if we would build our relationships on these understood values and rules, it would greatly help our church. 
Here's one. Love is patient. My goodness, this is hard. Dear church, there is not a single perfect person in this church. There is not. I look at this church building. Oh, we got stuff. You got stuff. She has stuff. He has stuff. We got stuff. We got issues. We got, we're short. We're, some of us are just mean sometimes. You wake up, wake us up at the wrong time of day. Oh, watch out. You don't get the right food in the morning. Oh, oh, hangry. Here we go. Okay. I, I, listen, we try our best. We smile and we look. Okay, let's, let's get this fact straight. No one is perfect. Okay. And today, some of you are going, well, that pastor, that sermon stunk today. Well, bear with me. Okay, bear with me. Okay, we, we're all just trying here. Okay, and one of the things, if we want to learn to survive as a church and learn to foster and grow as a church, this has to be the fundamental concept in our church. Love is patient. We've got to be patient with one another. When little kids are blowing up in the back, having their own private crisis, it happens, by the way. Kids do blow up. And we're like, we've got to be patient. When that person that you don't like very much in this church, I know, I know, I know, okay, I know. And they're talking a certain way, you're like, Pastor, he's at it again. I say, be patient. Patient makes the world go round. Patient is the grease that keeps this church sane. We lose patience, we're all in trouble. Yeah? Love is patient. Love is, here's the word, kind. You know, I could be a patient man, but kindness is tough. You hear me? Because I could suck it up. I like, don't get, I could do the whole, don't get angry, smile. You know, I could do that, okay? I could do the patient thing. But the kindness thing, kindness means being, yeah, going out, you know? It's doing things that I'm not comfortable with, okay? It's, it's smiling when you don't really want to smile, okay? It's loving them when they're not really lovable. Jesus said, it's easy to love your friends. It's easy to love people who love you back. You want to be a Christian? Love those who can't stand. Love those who drive you nuts. Be kind to those who don't deserve kindness. Jesus says, that's the true mark of a Christian. This is a test. But when kindness could happen at a church or in a marriage or any relationships, it is the it is the energy, it is the fuel that keeps it going. Does not envy. Oh, envy. Look at him. Look at her. Look what he has. Look what she has. Look how strong he has. Look how beautiful. No, look how... Envy will destroy us. When we start looking at each other, thinking, ah, oh, I want better, watch out. It does not boast. Dun, da, da. I'm telling you, we pastors have it hard. We're not here to boast. And trust me, it's part of us. Oh, look how good I am. Or look how bad I am. But my, brother, my brothers and sisters, God does not want us to compete. This is not a competition. Who's better or who's worse? It is not proud. Oh, can we lay this on the feet of Jesus? Pride, they say, is the root of all sin. Pride is what knocks us down. It is not rude. I, I hate to say this, but the church hasn't done a good job here. We haven't done a good job here. Um, when we see someone walk in church and they're wearing the wrong clothes, we give that look like, what are you doing here? Ouch, that really hurts, you know? And 
I, I've talked to 30 year olds. See, God bless Mike because he wasn't born an Adventist. He doesn't know. So you escaped it. Um, maybe that's why he's here, because he missed out. Um, I, I hate to say this, guys, but there's a lot of 20 year olds and a lot of 30 year olds who never set foot in church again. That's what they said in their mind. I will never set foot in church again. You know why? Because they came to church and their sh- skirt was a little high. Yay. And the elder came up to him and said, you better change that. You can't go up front with that. What are you doing? Why don't you take off this? It, it, it really hurts our kids. It, it, it makes an impact. Um, we become a church that's judgmental. You better not do this. You better not do that. And... and and I hate to say this, guys, 70, 80% of our kids have left church. These kids who are in our academies, by the way, not just, these are our academy kids. These are our, our best kids, okay? And they 70 to 80% have left the church. That hurts me as a pastor. I, I, I want to start crying as a pastor, but that number stinks because my, I have a burden for our kids, Yes? I, it, it pains me to see any of your kids not in church. It does. It pain. I mean, you know, when I talk to people, you know, I, I get the tears going. Talk about their kids. Talk about the kids, and they're not in church. It, I can tell. I can see the pain in their face because there's nothing more that parents want is that the kids in the kingdom. And when I see their kids not in church, it, it hurts them so much. And my friends, we as a church is responsible for this. And today we had a baby, baby dedication. And we want to love Michael, but the last thing we want to do was when he's 14 years old, he comes in his broken shoes and his backward hat and a new earring, and he's freaking out, okay? What have I done, okay? And the last thing he needs is for a church to stare at him and to look at him and say, you're bad. That's the last thing he needs. Kids are confused. No, no shock, no shame to the kids. You're still figuring life out. Yeah? Can we admit that? I hope so. We're figuring, we're all the world figuring things out. But the last thing a 13 or a 16 year old needs is a church to look down on them and to judge them. And we've been rude. We've been plain out rude. And that rudeness, this is not God's church. I don't want any part of that. And my friend, it's hurt us. And that's why we as a church has got to step up and do the opposite. We've got to heal where the hurt has come. Love is not self-seeking. I hate to tell you this. It's not about you. Are you okay? It's not about you. It really isn't. I hope you get a blessing from this sermon, but it's really not about you. We want to be loving and caring in this church because it's about everyone else. It's about your neighbor. It's about, is this person comfortable? Is this person comfortable? Is that person comfortable? Is the guest comfortable? It's about them. Amen? Amen. If church is about you, then we need to talk because it's not about you. It's about what we can share is about what we can give. It is about the people that's coming through. Every guest, Larry, God bless Larry, he's sitting there in that car. Roberta, I love Larry, and I'm praying for Larry. I hope he's not listening to this. But one day Larry will be in this church. I believe that, because we're praying for him. Because it's about him. It's about Larry. We want him in this church pews. We want him in back in relation with God. That's why we're here. It's not about you. And we made church about us. Oh, pastor, do this. I'm not happy with it. It's not about you. It's about what we're doing here. It's about the mission here. Yes, you're saying, we want to go to heaven, but it's not a reward. We've made a mistake. Heaven is a result that happens from the relationships that we have now. Do you hear me? Heaven is not a reward that the that future. Heaven is now. Heaven is something happening right now. When I love P, 
people here, it, it's changing me. Changing me for the better. And that's what God wants for us. It is not easily angered. This kind of deals with patience. <sighs> Take, you know, tell my kids, count to ten. Don't say it. Don't, 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 don't say it. Okay? Don't say it. Count to ten. Yeah, be careful of words, please. We read in James, there's nothing like the hot fire of a tongue. Yes? This thing is, this thing is, Kurt, we know that one, right? Yeah, yeah. We said things we shouldn't have said. Let's not say anything in anger. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envy. It is not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. In two weeks, we can talk about the last phrase. Love never fails. My friends, as Christians, we don't give up. The world beats you down. Yeah? Sin beats us down. Sin tells us we're failures. Sin tells us our life is just chaotic. But we don't give up because God never gives up. My friend, God has given us a beautiful church family. And whoever he's given, wherever you go, you don't have to be here. There are church families all over the world. When you go to Alaska, there'll be another beautiful church family up there to love. There are Christian families all over the world and God has given to us that we might love each other. But it is through our community we will find our salvation. It is by loving each other we will grow into God's grace. Turn with me to John. First John, sorry. First John chapter 3. Verse 14. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know, okay, you're a little rusty. You getting there? You're a little rusty. You getting there? Got it. Got it. I'm picking on Kirk this morning. 1 John 3, 14. It says this. We know that we have passed from what? From death unto life. Because we have loved the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. We have crossed over from isolation and death to life eternal when we have learned to what? Love. You see that? We, 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 our DNA says death, but our resurrection in Jesus says life. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother... This is John is powerful. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love a God whom he has not seen? My friends, our Christian walk needs more than just information, needs more than just what we're doing. It needs to be enacted in the lives of our brothers and sisters. I was talking to a, a gentleman this week. And we're talking about his life. Talking about his parents. And how he grew up. And he has a lot of hurt. And one of the biggest hurts he has in his life is that they were Christians. But they judged everybody. They criticized everybody. And they said, he asked him, well, Dad, how come you're not nice to you know, this person? And he goes, well, he's not a Christian, so why should I be nice to him? I'm like, oh, well, that worked well. Okay. Um, Christianity is about loving. We're, we're here to love. If, if, if Sabbath doesn't make us more loving, what's the point? If, if, if having a good diet and not eating meat, whatever, doesn't make us a better loving Christian, what's the point? And if we say we love God, I love God, and in the same mouth you hate your neighbor, what's the point? It's my own 
because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing that I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call God in Christ Jesus. My friends, I know who I was. I know the weakness I have, but God is going to push me forward to love like him. My friend, this is not talking about heaven. This is talking about relationships. This is talking about the love that God wants to inspire every single one of us. My friends, let's take our relationships seriously. Husbands, let's be honest. Don't just deal with your wife. Love your wife. Do you hear me? Don't just say, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't you know, no, love them. Same with wives. Men need, men need support. Love your husbands. Guys have it hard too. They need a, a wife who could be there to support them too. Love our children. Children, take some time for your parents. These relationships are important. Friendships are important. These are the realities of life. This is what I'm pressing towards. I want a better relationship with my wife. I want a better relationship with my children. I want a better relationship with my church. These are the things I want. You know, when it's all said and done, Peter was a, was a fisherman, did a lot of work for God. A lot of work for God. But when it was all said and done, he finally came to write a book. And this is what he says. Above all, what, what did Peter say? Above all. I mean, everything. Everything he's learned, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. First Peter 4 8. Yeah? Look at John. When John was all done, all said, he's all petered out, and he's, he's writing a book, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. Did you see the result? Love. He's not, they're not writing prophecies. They're not writing this. This is, the, this is the conclusion of the matter. This is what religion is. This is what everything is. It says love one another. For love is what? From God. And whoever loves has been what? Born of God. And knows God. If you want to know who love is, we need to love our neighbors. Paul says, be completely humble. Wow. Be, here's a word, gentle. Be gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. These, my friends, are the building blocks for our Christian relationships. The building blocks that we might grow in Christ. And finally, we will end with the words of Jesus. A new command. When Jesus says this, he's not getting rid of the old, by the way, okay? When Jesus says this, he's not getting rid of the Ten Commandments. He's not. But he's, he's summarizing the Ten Commandments. Do you, do you see that? He's summarizing the Ten Commandments. He's not getting rid of the Ten Commandments, but he's summarizing them. He's saying, here's a new command I give you. Here it is. Love one another. Get it? Thou shalt not kill. Love one another. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Love one another. Remember the Sabbath? Love one. Do you, do you see it? Do you see what Jesus is after? He said, you've learned the laws. You've kept the laws. But let's take it one step further because the goal of these laws is that you might love one another as I have loved you. Yes? So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. What's the Seventh Day Adventist? It is not people who don't do stuff on Friday nights. Okay? Oh, you're a Seventh Day Adventist. You're the guys who don't eat pork. Ah. Oh. Okay? What's the Seventh Day Adventist? Oh, you guys are prophetic people. Believe in prophet. Yes, those, all of those things are true. We believe in prophecy. We, we keep a diet. Yes, all things are true. But what really defines us as Seventh Day Adventist is this. We love each other. Yes? 
And if we don't love each other, then the gospel has fallen short. If our goal is to work towards heaven, we have fallen short. Our goal is to love each other, and the result of loving each other will be heaven. There is a big difference. Know that you are my disciples. Here we go. If you love one another. I'm telling you, this is the greatest challenge. It is. It is. There are prickly people here. Your pastor is honoring sometimes. But be patient with me. Let's be patient with each other. Let's be kind to each other. So when the stuff doesn't work up there, let's not go, hello, A.V. Let's be patient with those guys. They're doing their best. And when the person up here is singing a song and he's totally off key, no, you weren't, you weren't off key. You did fine. But when they're, if they're off key, you don't go, what a terrible song. So, no, they're doing their best. God bless them. And when a girl over here is it's like lip syncing, okay, not even moving his lips sometimes, God bless them for even standing up here. Okay? And when this pastor tries to do a sermon and we're like, ah, pastor, you did this, this, you dropped this one. Bear with me. May God be patient with me. And may I do better next time. Because this is how we work. Because love is the building blocks that makes this church work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for Jesus, who makes all things possible. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us tools that we might not just survive as a church, but thrive as a church. Let us embody what you have fought for, that is to love with all your heart, to give with all your heart. Let us be a church that loves with your heart. Be with us. Be patient with us. We, we, we come to you knowing that we need a lot of work. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to bless us this time. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.